Okay, we'll let a couple more folks in. Yeah, welcome everyone today. I think we will get started here with the presentation. We're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to go over some of the tax changes that have gone on for the upcoming year, for the upcoming season from last year. Go again and review out of scope that didn't change too much, but we'll go over that again and talk a little bit about resource sheets. Uh, that I could send a couple out. We'll talk about some other ones maybe I've got planned. And then we'll answer any questions, go over those three scenarios I had sent out. And somewhere in here where appropriate, if we need to, we will certainly take a 15-minute break. I'm hoping, well, it depends on how many questions and how much discussion we get, how much uh, time we need here. So, changes. Um, 4491 which you can get online, they don't print it. Basically the front part of that, um, Roman numeral seven through 13 has got uh, all the important changes that went on for this year from last year. Um, the changes to income levels and credit limits, I put on the, doc the reference document that I sent out and we'll talk about that a little more later. Changes to the tax forms. Our input, in, our interview sheet. Uh, as you know, we haven't talked this before, but they've uh, virtual currency is now digital assets, and they added the 1099K to the list of self-employment form examples because that is one that is start can start showing up now for self-employed people. Um, life events no longer has questions on the economic impact or advanced child tax credit, those are gone. So questions 10 and 11 went away. And there's a new question in the uh, additional info section. Question number seven, do you want information on how to vote or how to register to vote? Um, and United Way takes that one very seriously and we'll talk about that um, in a second here about what we're gonna do with that. Voter assistance registration. In that additional information section, a lot of times we don't pay as close attention to those questions as we do to the early ones where it has to be yes or no. But questions three and four in that, the refund and the balance due <clears throat> are questions that we definitely want to pay attention to or very critical. And now number seven, help with voting as well. If the answer is no, is no on that, we want to make sure they answer yes or no. We want an answer there. If they answer no, then we don't need to do anything else. If they answer yes, then we will point them in the right direction. We will not, as tax preparers, interviewers, we will not be helping them with early or absentee voting or with registration or arranging transportation. We're not going to get into that. All we are going to do is United Way is going to provide an information sheet at each site and you can have them with you at the table and they will give them to the client and this will direct them to voting resources. Transportation from what United Way is telling me is a big thing that people have concerns about. I can't get to the polling place. How can I get there? How can I make arrangements? How can I get help? At some sites, United Way is also gonna provide some folks and Meredith is hoping to get them trained as greeters and we'll talk about this in a little more in detail next week with processes um, who are trained in how to deal with these voter information issues. And we will direct, we can direct the client to those folks. Say, hey, when you're done here, go talk to Jane over there. She'll tell you all about how to handle your voter issues. But that's the extent of what we're gonna do as preparers and interviewers. But we do wanna make sure we give them some pointing in the right direction. Again, we'll talk about more of this next week. Any questions on that? The 1040, they expanded line one, 2021 is at the bottom, 2022 is at the top. All these other things that sort of got thrown into line one, they've now itemized them out. 
various things that they put up there. Um, they also added one under Social Security if they do any lump sum activity with their Social Security, that's going to get checked by tax layer. What went away is the breakdown of 12 with the charitable contributions, that is gone. We do no longer have that on, on the 1040 because if it's not, if they can't itemize and they're not on the federal anyway, they're not going to get their charitable, charitable stuff. Any questions on that? Page two. The some of the changes with the earned income, earned the income credit, they took away some of the added things they put in last year, foster homeless children and some age changes. So those breakdown questions are gone now. They were there in 2021. The recover rebate question is now gone. They rewarded 28 a little bit, and 30 is just reserved for future use. Again, we don't actually fill these out, tax player does, but there, if you have questions or, you can, or the client has questions or curious, this is where that all came from. Schedule one, part one. Last year, I don't know if you remember, they broke out that other income eight and added a whole bunch more subcategories to detail it out. Well, they added five more of them down there at the bottom. And it's not just left other income at Z, but they added more breakout for that line eight. So there's even more detail that'll, that can show up there. In part two, line section E is new that deals with Archer MSA and that long-term care contracts um, income that's out of scope for us anyway. So we're not gonna deal with that, but it is a new line on the form. And they uh, redid some of the stuff down there with the, with the uh, scholarships and that they added more details down there below in that section on eight. Those are the ones they added. Schedule two, part two. Line eight, they added in a checkbox. Um, this is when you have your tax penalty, additional tax, but they added a checks box that if you're not gonna use a form 5329, then the box will be checked. And again, tax layer takes care of it, but you might notice it's on the form, it's new. There's some new forms for 2023. We may or may not deal with them uh, next year, but let them, they're coming. They have a new form for next year for the clients if they ask. Um, if you're gonna do a W-4 for your pension, they have a new W-4P, which is only for periodic payments. I mean, that's the old form. The W-4P is only for periodic payments, like pensions and stuff. The new form is W-4R, and that is for non-periodic payments. In other words, if you decide to um, do some withholding from your IRA and you want to make it consistent, um, you can use a W-4R. But like things that you know happen every month, they still use the W-4P. But if they want to set a withholding for other stuff, there is a new form, the W-4R. And that's for next year. Also new for next year, I don't have any images of it yet. Um, and this gets to digital assets. Uh, they will have a specific 1099 to report digital asset transactions called the 1099DA. Right now they can show up on a 1099B, but they're giving them their own form. So next year, that'll be obviously a very big clue that we have digital asset. Any questions on any of those? Tax regs. Most of what they added a whole bunch of stuff in last year. So most of what changed this year is stuff that went away. The child tax credit. There are no more advanced payments. The maximum child credit went back to 2000. And some of this on that resource sheet I sent out is listed on there. There is no extra credit if the kid's under six. They dropped the age back. It has to be 16 or younger. 
and it is no longer fully refundable. It's still partially refundable, but it is no longer fully refundable. The earned income credit, they dropped the age limits back to their previous levels. They have to be between 25 and 64. As we saw on that 1040 form, they took away the option if you're a foster or homeless youth, extra, extra um, options for that. You cannot use your 2019 income anymore to calculate it. And they used to give a lot of, on that sheet I showed, if you didn't have any qualifying children, they still gave you increased opportunities and room to get that earned income credit. That also went away. So it was back sort of to previous levels. And on that sheet, it sort of outlines that. If you look to that, any questions on that? Now I'm going through a lot of these, um, not so much because we input anything or tax center takes care of all this, but we do get frequent questions from our clients on why something changed. Why didn't I get my $4,000 this year? How come? So understanding this a little bit and having the resource, you can say, hey, they knocked this stuff back. Look at this. I'm sorry, your kid aged out now. Um, you're now, you're over the income limit. So I'm sorry, yeah, you're not going to get that big credit you got last year. It just gives us a way. In other words, we don't want to just shrug our shoulders. I've said this before. We don't shrug our shoulders and say, well, that's what it is. If we can, we want to give the client some reason. Now, they may not be happy, but at least we give them some explanation. Well, Mark, I think that the logical answer here is that they made a lot of concessions for 2021 because of the COVID. I mean, we, we can see that. We can point to... Most of the things you have on this screen are related specifically to, to adjustments that they made for that year. Yep. And then they're all gone. Yeah. Now, oh, they were one year. Around. Around. One and done. What also went away? Um, job spending tax card credit dropped back. It's no longer refundable. It was refundable last year. And they dropped back the percentages and the phase out income levels. So I can see there, this one is not on that resource sheet. I uh, will talk a little bit. In fact, I'm gonna ask you later what we wanna do with this because I think this is also a useful piece of information to have handy to talk to the client. So, you know, why they're not getting as much money for their childcare expenses as they used to. What went away? Uh, private mortgage insurance is not deductible again. That have gone back and forth in and out a couple of times, but it's off the table again for 20, 2022. Uh, again, that charitable contribution without itemizing went away. There's one thing in the background that we didn't directly deal with, but it affected their um, ACA uh, premium credits that it, they, again, for the COVID, they said, well, even if you got a high level, if you went on unemployment or could or were eligible for unemployment, we will assign you a 133% federal poverty level income, even if you were way above that. And it allowed them some extra credits. That's gone. So if they're over that 133, they're not going to be get as much of the uh, ACA credit as they used to. And the again, the economic impact payments, recover rebate credits, those all, those are gone. Any questions on those? What is still in effect? Uh, federal student loan issues. There's that's the private loans. Private loans are still not covered, but the loan relief was to end last year, but it's been extended. There's still that's still going out there, and we don't know for sure now when it's gonna, how long it's gonna go. Uh, any loan forgiven after the end of 2020 are tax free. Uh, they should not have issued a 1099C for that forgiveness. It should just be a letter. Um, and the sunset date on that right, that right now is the end of 2025. Employers can still provide over $5,000 in loan assistance. It goes on the W-2, reduces their income. And again, the current sunset date on that is the end of 2025. Mortgage debt forgiveness is still in effect. Some of the changes they made to that. Again, principal residence can't be used for a business. You can't be bankrupt. It's $750,000 is the, is the maximum reduction. If you're filing separate, it's half of that. 
the debt has to be forgiven after 2020. And again, this is also set to sunset at the end of 2025. It could be a 1099C um, theoretically, but I, I've never seen a 982, but I'm, the documentation says that could be used also. If it's a foreclosure, you may see a 1099A. This can be very complicated. I don't, I think I mentioned last year, I'm not sure why they leave that, all this in scope for us. It can be simple if all it is a 1099C with a simple maximum, but it can get really messy. I hope we don't see any messy ones. Any questions on that? Residential 100 credits got extended for one more year. And the same as last year has to be their primary home, cannot be a new build. Again, the last lifetime credits going back to 2006 are only $500 and $200 for windows. They have to meet the Energy Star requirements. Usually the document, the, the contractor, the installer says, yeah, meets Energy Star. Um, the credits vary by the type of installation. It goes on form 5695. Part one is still out of scope. Geothermal, wind, solar, that kind of stuff. They put in uh, heat pumps, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, part two is your windows, doors, roof insulation stuff. And that time, that's what we can cover. Uh, the limits are supposed to go up next year. That's still 500 and, and 200 right now. Uh, they're supposed to go up for 2023, but they haven't said how much. Earned income credit. Um, this is permanent now, doesn't even have a sunset. So if you don't have, if your children, it used to be several years ago, if you had a child that didn't have a social security number, you couldn't get earned income, earned income credit, period. You were shut out. They changed it. And now if your child doesn't have a social security number, you can still get the credit, but you're treated for the limits and the rules as if you don't have any children. You go under that column to see if you qualify for the EIC. Uh, the cutoff is now up to, for investment income, cutoff is now up to 10.3,000. They set it at 10,000 last year and they are now indexing it for inflation. And it is allowed for a spouse, separated spouse. Again, this talks about this whole thing being separated, but you had qualifying children more than half the year, you were either legally separated or you didn't live with your spouse the last six months of the year. So you can still get EIC, even though you're separated and um, filing MFC. Other changes and extensions, educator expenses went from 250 to 300. And they added the fact that those expenses can include personal protective equipment, things to prevent spreading COVID, disinfectant, masks, those kind of things. So that can be a valid educator expense. The mileage rates, as you know, changed mid-year. Um, those are the new miles before and after. And those are the changes to the SSA uh, limits if you want to take those as, um, if you got an HSA, what they can contribute to an HSA. Any questions on those? Okay, out of scope stuff. And this was primarily the front of Pub 4012. A lot of pages on this up there. I did not list everything here, um, just the stuff that potentially we might see. Self-employed, those first three are the ones that we do see the most. If they had a loss, they had inventory depreciation. I haven't seen too many folks with expenses that huge, self-employed, that come to us, but they may. If they have, uh, if they paid other people, they had their own employees, we can't do it. If they use their home for a business, we can't do it. If they were, if it was not for profit, we can't do it. Professional God gamblers, if their business was bartering. And then there's another form, which we I've never seen, the 95A, I've never seen that, but that's also put to that out of scope. 
Rental income, we do see folks coming in with that. We can't handle any rental income. Even if it's simple, we can't deal with it. Agriculture, fishing, forestry, clergy, active military. People do come in with casualty theft losses, especially during derecho, but even without that, um, no, we can't do that either. Um, the only cancellation of debt we can do is credit card, student loan, and that basic primary residence. Um, and they have to be solvent. We can only deal outside of Roth, we can only deal stand with standard IRAs. We cannot do SEP or simple. We can't deal with excess contributions. <clears throat> we can't do with non-deductible contributions that are other than Roth. Um, and if a st standard IRA rollover for some reason is not tax-free, we can't deal with it. Ten ninety nine R. This is the one where we see the most things that we get caught as out of scope. Um, the first one we don't see if the taxable amount is not determined, but the simplified method for determining that hadn't been used. I have never run into that. Maybe somebody has, but I haven't seen it. Um, the box seven is where we get the most. Six J and T are the most common ones that we see that are out of scope. Um, six deals with life insurance. <clears throat> J and T deal with weird Roth transactions that we're not allowed to do. Usually it's 741 G or Q. Um, if you have any questions in, in anything, if, if you have a, if you can, if you're not sure, go look it up in the 4012. 1090, the interest and the dividend are all are usually in scope. But if you see anything that's not in a box that you recognize, go check the 4012, because I have some odd stuff in various boxes. I'm not going to list them all here. Um, K1 is only in scope for those things that are on the K1. There's a lot of boxes on that K1, uh, tax exempt, interest, dividends, capital gains, and royalty with no expenses. We can handle those. We cannot do MSA or Archer. Uh, we cannot do IRA when they've moved it from their IRA into an HSA. We cannot do that. And we cannot deal with excess contribution penalties. And as I mentioned before, with the energy credits, we can do part one. I mean, we can do part two. Part one is out of scope. And occasionally somebody comes in and when I put they put in a, a, a wind turbine on their property or put, a, put on their solar panels. I'm sorry, we can't handle that. That's part one. Charity, um, non-cash contributions. And that one I should put an asterisk by it because what we typically do in that case, we can have a little leeway. We can say, look, you've, you're donated 800 United Way. We can give you 500. Otherwise, we can't do it. And they'll usually say, okay, give me the 500. So that one, we have a little gray area of flexibility. Uh, any charity carryover, which I've never seen, but we can't, hint, we can't deal with that. And if they were using their home for rental or business, we can't deal with the sale of the home. We cannot deal if they bought a new uh, a new Tesla goes on form eighty nine thirty six. We cannot deal with those credits, adoption expenses, um, capital assets. This is what it is in scope for standard tax and bonds. We can do capital loss carryovers. The only adjustment we can do is a wash sale, the W. Anything else? If you if you're not sure, you will check the forty twelve. We cannot do with penalties for estimating if we for estimating a tax penalty line 38 on the 1040. We do not mess with that. We do not mess with alternative minimum taxes. <clears throat> and the only 1099K that we can deal with is self-employment or gambling winnings. Anything else for 1099K we can't deal with. Any questions on those? 
Yeah, Mark, this is Russ. Could you yeah. go back to the IRA on taxable distribution? It was a couple of slides back. Yeah. Um, standard IRA rollovers that are not tax free. Um, as long as they got the, say they rolled from their IRA to a Roth, they would have to pay taxes on the rollover. Yeah. But uh, said besides Roth, this is a standard IRA rollover between standard IRAs. Okay. Okay. All right. And there are certain weird situations. Normally that's tax free, you just move it from one to the other. Right. There are certain weird situations where they become taxable and okay. we can't deal with those. Okay. Thank you. Did that answer your question? Yeah. And also on the charity thing, if it's obvious they aren't going to itemize, even if they had a lot of charity stuff over the 500, we could just say, well, if you don't itemize, it doesn't matter. You're not going to get it anyway. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that with the state. I'm going to I'll say it now. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about this more on the 28th a lot. They can't itemize on the federal, but a lot of times they can itemize on the state. That's so true. People want to pay attention to what they, what they have for deductible items. Right, right. So Mark, in regard to the charitable deductions, since we're on that topic, are, are we to just take their view of valuation on what they've contributed? Yes, pretty much. Okay, thank you. Unless you have something that's really, really blatantly wrong, but otherwise it's between them and the IRS. Because most people just come in with their little uh, you not with their little uh, goodwill thing and says, yeah, I gave $600 and closed to goodwill. Okay. Um, we can't, um, if they want to donate a car, that fourth, we can't handle that no matter what. There's no way we can say a car is under, because no matter what, they have to fill out that other form, that uh, that form, no matter what, for a car or something. And we can't, it's a, other than a secondary form, and I forget the number, that we're not allowed to deal with. Mark, what do you do if uh, they walk in, they said, hey, I took three bags to a Goodwill. What was, how do you, how do you suggest to them that uh, the value for that? I don't, I say, what do you think? I can't be in that business. Goodwill won't do it, I can't do it. I'm gonna say, how much do you think those clothes are worth? How much do you think Goodwill will sell them for? Is really what you is really what the IRS is looking for when they say the thrift shop value for valuating it. What do you think I Goodwill's gonna get for those clothes you gave them? And they, that's that's basically all, like, all we can do. Any other questions? Okay, let's talk about the resource sheets I sent out. I sent out the credit limits and uh, that sheet, which I sent out. I sent out the digital asset sheet. Um, and that one, <clears throat> I don't know how much we're gonna run into, but it's very muddy. And I talked to the IRS about it and they didn't help me too much. Um, so my core guideline I'm coming up with this is if, they were using regular dollars instead of DA. Would it affect their taxes? Would it show up in their income or they try to take a deduction? And if the answer is yes, then it's out of scope because we're not gonna let them do that with DA. They can do a lot of different things with DA that don't affect their taxes and that's fine. We, we're not gonna worry about those. Um, and the point is if they do something where we have to check that box, yes, in tax layer where they said they did digital assets, then we don't, shouldn't even get that far because it's out of scope. We should never be checking that box in tax layer because it's out of scope if we have to. Does anybody have any questions or want to go over that digital asset sheet? Well, Mark, I guess my question would be if, if they paid for anything with crypto, that's out of scope, right? Well, they can buy stuff with crypto. But are they claiming it as a deduction? That's a capital. That's a capital change, right? I mean, no. the, the crypto if, value if when I, they acquired. If I bought something with with dollars. If they bought something with digital assets, and that's the question. If they had paid dollars for it, 
Would it show up in the taxes? No. So I don't care about it if they do digital assets. I agree, but I think it's different with crypto. I think that's a capital, that's a capital gain or loss in the value. Then they should of get a form they, acquired they should have gotten when they used it. They should have some kind of documentation uh, that really shows that. I mean, like if I settled that's I the example I used in my sheet is they settled a bet with a friend. Okay, we're 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 disallowing them from doing their taxes because they settled a bet with a friend. No. That to me the it get, I mean, again, you're right. It gets really, really muddy. And for our purposes, since the IRS wasn't much help for me, that's the guideline I'm trying to come up with that I'm hoping 50 volunteers can get their head around and be consistent with. Well, I, I think you're right. If, if they don't have paper from, from their crypto company, it's probably not going to get flagged. I just... I'll feel more comfortable, I think, next year when they have to, when there's a requirement for them to issue the 1099 DA. Yeah. Well, yeah, that requirement's still in flux. They're arguing about what the limits are on that and everything else. But, and the other thing, how many folks are going to tell you, oh, yeah, I bought, I bought a pair of shoes with DA. Okay. They're not going to bring that in. Um, but if they do get anything from anything, any of those exchanges, or if they actually bought on NASDAQ, some of the, yeah, then they're, and NASDAQ gives us a, a 1099B with that, then yeah, we're we're done. But I'm not, I'm not conceding your point, but I'm not sure how we can consistently handle that right now. And that's my solution for this year. Understand. And if people ever, if you have real heartburn about that, I mean, we can, we can go back, but I'm just trying, I get my goal is to find something that we can consistently recognize among all the volunteers so we're consistent. And you're right, I don't think the IRS is going to do anything about them. I mean, they're still trying to figure it out. Wouldn't we just ask the taxpayer, is any of these items in digital assets? You can let you brought. And I need the documentation they give you. And it goes back to documentation. Did, they, did anything you're showing me get done with digital assets? Right. I think that's that's that'd be the question. I don't want to go digging into stuff they didn't show me or they didn't bring up. No. After all, it is their return. <clears throat> that's their return. So, I mean, just, I mean, I, I don't want to get everybody make anybody uncomfortable doing this or anything else. I'm just trying to come up with something that I'm hoping fairly straightforward that we can all can be consistent with. And if somebody really has heartburn with it, you know, let me know and we'll have further discussion. I mean, because some, some of it's really clear if they have documentation, but as Brian said, if they've done something but is is buying something with digital assets just the act of buying a pair of shoes with digital assets is that a capital activity and that's a muddy question i don't know if that's true or not so if that's the case then in in pure technical terms yes you've sold a digital you've sold a capital digital digital asset for something else and that is a that is an out of scope activity in theory pure technical by the, we want to take it to that extreme. But I could not get an answer out of the IRS on that, so. Yet, at least in their state, they're still figuring it out. Vehicle okay. registration fees, I'm gonna get that out before the 28th. Um, I spent a lot of time on this last year. I'm not going to be at least on this training. I'm going to get out the sheet and we'll talk about it more if we need to on the 28th. Um, the key point in all this is the deduction is based on weight only of the vehicle. If you get into EV, EV vehicle with all the fees and stuff on there, those are not part of what you can count for their taxable deduction. Mark, yeah. where does that deduction go? 
If you go can... into um, other taxes paid. Okay. Next layer. And there is a spot down there saying personal property tax. Yeah. And that is the spot where it goes. Okay. I, okay. We put the registration fee there, right? <laughs> you put the, the appropriate percentage of the percentage of the weight of that registration fee that is the, based on the weight goes in there. And there's the formula. You take the weight and you divide it by 250. And that is what you subtract out of the fee. So if they paid $130 for their car and it weighed, in fact, I, I, I think I, um, I had a couple examples on that or not. Um, you did in one of the um, <laughs> scenarios. In one of the scenarios, basically, um, you, you figure it out, and then that is what that is what you can deduct is the is the registration fee minus the weight divided by two fifty. Oh, okay. Thank you. Unless it's an older vehicle, then it's right. sixty percent. No. If it's more than ten years old, then it's sixty percent of the. Yeah, uh, that's what I want to put on that that that, in, that resource sheet. Get into all the that stuff. <clears throat> okay. And the gambling resource sheet, a lot of that I already put on the Baker notes. And <clears throat> I hope to get that sent out soon. Um, talking about the stuff that's going on with gambling, because sports betting throw a whole new wrinkle into all this and some of the new stuff that's coming out. And so we have to deal with that. Now I'm gonna ask a question. Um I'm just thinking, okay, instead of me running it through all here and, and slides and slides, and then you have to, if you want to know, you either have to find it in 4012 or go dig it up back in the slides. Are those resource sheets, resource sheets worthwhile, this concept? Yes. I think so, yes. I would agree. Yep. <laughs> yes. Now, there's a couple okay. of charts I had in here that I did not get onto that one sheet about... Um, Child dependent care credit. So I actually have a poll because I'm, my goal on those sheets was to keep them to two pages so you could have one sheet front and back that was handy for you. That's my my rough my concept on that. Um, where's my polls? There they are. So I'm going to send you guys a poll. Because I had a couple of sheets, the, the child credit, the uh, mileage, and, and the HSA, um, one that I did not get on that sheet. So I'm going to ask you what you want me to do with them. Because I can create a third sheet, or I can take something off, or I can just not put them on. Well, it seems like the very strong majority says, yeah, add a third page, okay? I may rearrange them a little bit, um, but I'll add a third page and get them on there. Okay. That takes care of that. And the gambling one, like I say, I'll take what I wrote for the Baker notes. I'll try to refine that a little bit. And I hope to get that sent out yet this yet the next week. Now the vehicle registration, I have to do a little more research, and I'll get that out because when we get into um, Iowa, is where we really when we start getting. If you're not itemizing, it doesn't play that much of a role. That's why Iowa is where it really starts to play a role as far as a lot of people do itemize. Okay, Tiana Baker. Anybody have any questions we've gone over on anything we've gone over so far? I want to go back and look at something else. Okay. Tiana Baker. Okay. And just have some discussion here. Um, I can bring up my answers, my 1040, if you want to see it, or some of the documents that I sent out. And again, gambling is usually straightforward, but it can be messy. Um, and in tax layer, it's interesting on this. 
if you're filling out the W2G, um, it puts a spot in tax layer that's not on the W2G. What are your losses? That usually doesn't show up in the W2G, but you can put it in there. And on that screen, tax layer does say, no, you can't put in more than your winnings. But you can also put in gambling losses and other spots in another spot in tax layer under the deductions. And, you, and if they come to give you a 1099K or, or a 1099 miscellaneous for winnings, those go in separately in tax layer. So you can play, you can put a bunch of losses in there and ta tax layer does not try to sum all those different ones up. So it is up to you as an interviewer and a preparer if they have multiple sources to make sure that any losses they're trying to claim don't exceed their winnings. I have a small question. Um, on this one, there was nine dollars in interest income that she showed you on the phone on her phone. She yep. didn't get a ten ninety nine interest form for it. Should we include it since we were told about it? Yes, I put it on mine because it actually she didn't. If it's less than ten dollars, they don't have to send you a ten ninety nine interest. Right. But I'm saying Tiana was. Was honest. She had her end of the year credit union statement that showed during the year you got nine dollars in interest. So she showed me that on her phone and said, "Oh, by the way, my credit union gave me nine bucks in interest last year." Okay. So that's what I did. I put it. So should it go in the other income? No, it's under ten ninety nine interest. But you don't have to. You put it on the ten ninety interest form. But all you need there is the name of the credit union. It doesn't force you to put in the idea. The oh, okay. The See, idea. that's why I didn't think I should put it there because we didn't have all the information. Okay. It, it, it actually, in either case, it's going to show up correctly in the taxes and the IRS isn't going to care. But you can put it in under, you put it in under the interest, put in the $9 and then just put the credit union name in there because you are okay. forced to enter the credit union name. But yes, you could have put it under other, other income. It's going to show up the same in the taxes. Um. Mark, um, I saw that showed up on 1099B or the 1040B schedule. Um, you can't just go directly to that and, and put it there or will that screw everything up? You say, I, that's what I was trying to do because I was worried I didn't have the EIN to put it in on the interest statement. The 1099B and the other, because of that combined statement, that actually is a 1099 interest and a 1099 div and a 1099B that they send you. It's a combined statement. Yeah. So you've got, you should have on that sheet, I sent, you should have the identifier for the financial institution. So you go to 1099 interest and put all that in. Yeah, no, I meant the, on the actual 1040 return, Schedule B. Um, oh, Schedule B. That's where it carried to. Yeah, that's where, that's right. Right, but with tax layer, can we just go there and put it there? I mean, I didn't no. do that, but. No, okay. no, that's what I was wondering. No, you know, put it in under the interest, income interest, and the tax layer. Tax layer populates the 1099B. You don't. I mean, the schedule B. I'm sorry, the schedule B. You don't. Good question, though. But on this one, Tim, again, with gambling and other deductions, we need to capture them fully. Um, and look at it because tax layer can't do it all for us in that case. Because uh, again, they may get IOI imaging depending on what's going on. Anything else on Tiana that we want to go over or you have questions on or didn't? You had, wasn't sure what were, how that turned out. Now, when I put the $9 on the 1099 um, interest form, it aired me and forced me to put in a address an address yeah but i just figured it's because it's the test site i'm assuming no. the live probably wouldn't I, do that and all it made me put in was the name of the credit union if i and left the rest of it blank and i could cook it did you try to put in any other did you leave the name of the credit union blank nope i put in put in a name there wow okay i just figured maybe it's the test site and maybe they're changing some stuff and it's, I have no idea. Because I noticed that on yours, and I'm just like, okay, whatever. I did. I, that error. I did it on mine, and it aired the first time. But I went back a second time, and it let me through. 
Oh, okay. Because I do know in the 4012, it says to put it on that. Yeah. On D11, <laughs> page D11, it yeah. says to put it in the 1099 interest. So, yeah. All right. I will go back and play with that a little more. I did not get that error, so. And but, I did mine last night. So, and I know you did yours the night before, I believe. Yeah, so, yeah they're always doing updates on this stuff and everything. Yeah. Anything else on Tiana? All right, I have a question. Yeah. Your, your earned income credit was $55 more than mine. Any idea where I missed $55? Let me get out of my presentation here a second and open up Tiana, spend 40. So the earned income credit. <laughs> So where, if you look at Schedule EIC down here, you can find it. There it is. So what was different on yours? Then well, we got the EIC, she qualifies. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm trying to think where it, where it calculates that. Yeah. Credit retirement, you know, tax credit. Okay, I forget where it actually calculates the earned income credit. Page 18, Mark. Page 18? I think so. That's credit for other dependents. Oh, I'm sorry. I was wrong. There's the, there's the information on it. Where does it show up? The worksheet is page 26. Wow, okay. Thank you. Probably everybody else has it, but I just. Way down here. Okay, there's the IC worksheet. Okay, so there's the earned income. And you look up on the table. So, what is different on yours on the worksheet? Okay, so it's page 28, you said, of the. 26 is where it starts. Okay, 26 is the return. All right, I will go look at that because I couldn't find it. So thank you. Well, the, the number that was correct was 1809. And my reaction to why it would be different is for if, if for some reason you put a number in something like additional income or something that was not treated as earned income, for example, you know, maybe, for example, if you put that $9 for interest, if you put that in some column in the in the works in tax layer that was treated as uh, earned income, that would change uh, the yeah. calculation that you'd be there. It'd be wrong, but it, it would change the calculation. So I probably need to go find more earned income. <laughs> well, you would well. find it, like I say, because my, my reaction would be that some dollars you put in there were diff were placed in a non or in or non earned income bucket. Okay. In Thank you. I'll go look at that. This thing jumps around part four. Do do does your front page of your 1040 look the same as his front page? Yes. That doesn't seem logical, unfortunately. 
Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. maybe I, I was thinking that it did. Maybe I'll go back and look. Maybe I'm remembering wrong. Find out what we'll changed, what's different on that worksheet, and then we'll try and back it in and, and see where okay where, where something's different. All right. Thank you. Anything else on this one while well, I got it open? Hey, Mark, you, you specifically mentioned in your notes that she was solvent all year. Yeah. And I know that's important to keep it in scope. Maybe I'm getting too specific, but what if they were only solvent for part of the year? The question is, were they solvent at the time the debt was forgiven? Saying they were solvent all year makes that very clear. If they weren't okay. solvent, then you have to say, what was your financial situation at the time this debt was forgiven? That is the, the critical thing. And if they weren't solvent all year, then that can be an interesting discussion to try and figure out. Okay, thank you. Hey, this is Kathy. I have a question. The marketplace, when I went in, I accidentally marked the 100%. If they were, uh, I can't get back to that question, is the household below the 100% poverty level? So now it's showing that they have to pay back uh, like $934 back in net premium tax credit. So I couldn't go back. It wouldn't bring that question back really? up. Uh, yeah, I tried and tried. I tried to, yeah, I couldn't get it so I could unmark it. It's interesting. Let me, let's, um, let's go back. I wonder now. Um, Let me see if I can move this new window here, bring it over. Let's go to favorites. Volunteer, Vita. Homepage, Springboard. Let me just go ahead. Go to Ms. Baker here. And health insurance. Yes. Where was that? Okay. All right, so that question. See how it doesn't show back up in there? The 100% poverty level? Well, the only reason I could, the only way I could think of to do that is, let me jot down the numbers here quick. Well, and I tried to, I tried to take everything out, go back, answer, no, they didn't have insurance through the marketplace. Oh, and then I oh, went back didn't? and answered yes, and it still came back oh, really? like this. I was, I was, I was, what I was going to do is, is go back and change the answer to no, and then come back in and see. You try uh, it and see if I, I couldn't get it to come back, that question to come back. Well, let's see what on happens. the screen prior to this one, can you delete their personal information? Okay, we'll say no. We'll save and exit. Then we'll come back in. Let's see what happens. Now that I didn't do, so maybe. Back into Baker.
independence, had a new house, not doing any of that. Override calculated family size. Nope, we're not going to do that. Okay. Not eligible. No. Yes. Yeah, see, it would it asked before then, before he got to where he entered the numbers. Yeah, it's not giving you a chance to do that again. So would you always answer yes to that question? Or wait, no, 100%. Um, I think I wonder. I think. There's a, yeah, I think. What, in the 10, in the 4012, it mentioned so long as there was money in column C. Just a sec, I'm going to try to find it. information no that's now you got, you got me baffled yeah <laughs> i i tried and tried so i'm like what well and well i would suspect I, that is a let me uh i suspect i should probably put that into the uh support question for them saying how come that question disappeared. Let's uh, let's do okay. something. Let's get out of here for the second. Let's actually open up one of the other ones just to see where they go up Langford. I'm going to play games with it here. And I try, yeah, I paid closer attention when I did the next one to see what what well, exactly I marked that now. Now, so now if I say yes that, here, but... we never went in there before. I say yes to her. And there's the, the family members. And no, no, yes. He didn't even ask the question here. Oh, that's weird. I think that question went away. I'm not sure because here I've never been in here before with this with Lang with Langford. So I came in the first time. You you would think then it would ask me the question, but it's not. If you start a new one, it'll be there because that's how I did it when I started a new. Because you have already answered what this no Langford was no. That's correct? true. So, so you've already what? Well, yeah, once you answer it, that first one, then yeah, because if you start a whole new person, then it'll be that question will be there. Okay. Yeah. Well. I might just go start her over again. So don't, okay. yeah, I don't want you to spin it. That is time. okay. I can make a note of that. I'm, Isn't that weird? I'm that I that. kept if I looking. To put in a, a request to a tax layer about a bug. I well, have this. Oh, go ahead. I have the same problem when that, uh, after you enter the basic or the thing, and then it comes in for Iowa, and if you don't answer the one question about, do you want the medical to carry over? If you answer one way or the other, then it doesn't carry over. If you put, anyway, it doesn't carry over to the front page if you check that you want it to go to A. And I know I've done it before and somebody showed me how to correct it, but I can't remember. Yeah, all you're talking about, do you want to carry medical into Schedule A? Or right, a, yeah. You have to actually go into the Iowa return, and there you have to go through a couple of clicks and find the spot to, to get that corrected. It's, it's not I intuitive. couldn't find it. It's not intuitive. Okay. All right. Somebody will have to show me if I do it again. Well, we'll go through that on the 28th. It's, it's on page H10, and it says answer yes in most cases in which the household income is below 100% of the FPL. 
Answer yes, if there's an amount in column C on form 1095A for one or more months, or one of the individuals on the taxpayer form 1095A is lawfully present, but ineligible for Medicaid. I had to look that up. I'm just like, I don't remember this question. I'll dig into it a little more. But that is, a. I don't, I don't want to spend time here trying to open a whole new thing and go, let's, everybody, there's 20 odd people want me to step through and try yeah. to do them. So. so where was that, 10H? Or what, H10? H10, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. Any more questions on uh, Tiana? One question on the 1099C. I assume that the box that has interest in it means nothing to us since I found no place to enter that. Is that correct? Um, the interest, um, if you look at the out of scope in the, in the 4012, that comes into play only not for a personal, um, it does not apply or work, affect anything if it's just a personal, like a credit card debt forgiveness. There is one or two spots where it does make it out of scope and I'd have to open up the 4012 and look and see where it is. Um, we can do that. No, it's not necessary. I just was looking for a place trying to figure out, do you subtract that interest from no. what their taxable portion is or anything like that that it was it, it, it says that interest was included in the above amount and so they okay. got all that money forgiven including the interest so yes it's all okay potentially taxable yeah that was that's the scope of my question not whether it was in or out of scope yeah. so thank you hey mark sometimes uh, uh somebody will ask me did you put my pin number in there and uh, let's say if you've already closed it out, I, I don't know, is everybody aware of where you would determine that information just by looking at the form? Oh, on the 1040? Yeah, on the 1040. It, it is. Will show, it will show, show up, up automatically. What's that? It'll show up. It'll show up automatically on the back right, right there. there. Yeah, on the, on the back page of the 1040. By their signature, by where yeah. they would sign. Yeah. So if they, if they have I know sometimes then, people ask me, sometimes people ask me to show that, <laughs> prove that, that we have that number there. Okay. Good point. Anything else? Okay. Gloria Langford. Um, we will see a parent as a dependent. Uh, many times it is not uncommon for us to see that they're taking care of a grandparent or a parent. Um, in this case, for early withdrawal, the Schedule A is helpful, even though she's doing standard deduction, because medical reason for for reducing the penalty is one of, is one of the few ones that we deal with that's got a limit on it. You have to say you can only reduce it by what's over their 7.5% um, medical bills. And the top of the Schedule A very nicely tells you that. Even though it doesn't apply for our itemizing and deductions, it very nicely gives you that number. And then you can take that back when you go into 5329 and say this much is, is uh, not taxable or not penalty. Not, that doesn't apply to the penalty. So, and the parent is a dependent. Um, I think I mentioned, I mentioned in the notes, the key things with that, where you really want to do, it gets to be doing a thorough interview, is what is the true income and the support levels for that parent? How much money did they make? And are they really paying? Is the child really paying full, full support of that parent? 
Uh, those are the things that sometimes you really have to talk to them and, say, and make sure you're, because that's what determines whether they can be dependent or not. And the other thing that catches you and that footnote is that Social Security does not count as income in these cases. If that parent's getting Social Security and you're looking at, that, are they over the income levels and stuff, Social Security for the parent does not come into play with that. Anything we want to go over or look at with uh, Gloria? Can you show us where you got that Schedule A number? I was struggling with that. Sure. So let's look what we got here. Don't need Baker anymore. But we will grab Gloria. Uh, 1040. And 40, practical no schedule. Schedule two, schedule three, schedule A. Right there. Up here at the top, it, it adds up all her, got her income, it adds up all her medical expenses you put in and said, here's the 7.5% limit. So this is what's left over. And that's the number then that is available to say, okay, I can take that to reduce what you paid for a penalty out of that 4,000 that she took out early. So if you go look at the calculation on that down below, the, the 4,000 minus 318 is 900 and, 900 and whatever dollars they end up with. A, so 10% of that, you end up with a $92 penalty. Okay, thank you. And where do you enter that, that number, that 3018? Okay, let's go back to here. Back to the practice lab. I hate the time out is so short in that practice lab. I hate to log out. It so is. I don't. It's going to time out on me all the time. I understand they're worried about security stuff, but it is a very short timeout. So let's go to Gloria. Federal section. And let's go look at her tax on early distribution. There's the form 5329. So there's where it goes. That's the early distributions that are not subject to tax. So I took that 318 off the 318 says, okay, this is my excess over the 7.5%. So that I can take that and say, okay, I can reduce my early distributions by that that are subject to tax and it's medical expenses. So if you go look at the worksheet then in the 1040, it takes the 4,000 minus the 3018 and takes 10% of that. And that's where you get the $92 tax penalty that you had to pay. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Yep. Anything else on Gloria? Say so normally, most of the time they print this out and it's sort of an annoyance because it doesn't apply to the taxes 90, 98% of the time. But for this particular case, it gives you, it helps you out and provides the number for you. Okay, we will, that's Gloria. Anything else on Gloria then? Okay, Gunther and Mary. And this one we don't see, we don't see too many of these, but they do show up occasionally. But I put it in there, qualified charitable distribution. Um, 
And the reason I just wanted to run through these is this is not something that shows up on the 1099R. The 1099R is collectively, you can make, I can take four distributions from an IRA during the year and the 1099R just you know, sums them all up and says, here's 1099R, here's everything you took out of your IRA. There's nothing on there indicating that one of them might've been a qualified charitable distribution. You need, there should be a document from the financial institution, a letter or from the receiving charity that lets you know, yep, that this portion of it or this amount was a key with a qualified charitable distribution. Um, typically, you don't have to worry about the age because the financial institution and the charity should be checking that, especially the financial institution knows what your age is and they shouldn't let you do a QCD if you're under 70 and a half. Um, because I think there is there is a control there. Um, obviously, if you look at, if it gets past that, you look at your clients only 65 years old and they click them in a QCD, then something's off. You can't, that's not, you can't do that. Um, but the letters may not be quite as nice as the ones I did, but the charities typically, at least the ones I've seen, specifically note, yeah, I got a QCD. And typically on the check document, when they send the check, and the, if you get a copy of it, it notes on the check and the documentation saying, yeah, this is a QCD. And it's tri tricky in TaxLayer because you have to manually, TaxLayer doesn't know unless you tell it. So you have to manually subtract out that from the taxable portion. So what you are putting in for the 1099R doesn't match what's on the actual 1099R, which usually is a no-no for us. But in this case, it's the only way we can do it. And then you flag the, the uh, QCD input in tax layer. And if you notice on the 1040, then it puts this little note down at the bottom. Let's see if I can pull up and get, get out of here. And we'll pull up there, 1040. How much do we got here? I don't know if it's a specific form or not. Yep. Well, no. Go down. Come somewhere at the bottom of 1040. Right. Right. You know, where to go? There it is. It says line 4B is a QCD. And this isn't IRS, this is tax layer. Other tax software actually will put a note up here by this saying QCD, depending on what software you're using. Tax layer happens to put it down here, the 4B QCD, to, so everybody knows that there's a, that's why that doesn't match. Did, did you have to put that somewhere in TaxLayer, Mark, to make TaxLayer know it's a QCD? Yeah, I did, and I'm trying to remember where it went. I, th I think you mark a box. Let me get out of Gloria. And let's get back into Langford. Let's get to, into Solver here. For those that aren't familiar with a QCD, I'll just add a couple of things here. Um, basically, a QCD is a contribution directly to a charitable contribution or to a charitable organization from your IRA, from your traditional IRA. So you never touch it at all directly. You're, they're sending it directly. Uh, the other part of that is that that charitable contribution that you're that's going directly to that organization is not a tax deduction. In other words, if I put, let's say, uh, a bazillion dollars, whatever a bazillion dollars is, in a QCD, I would not be able to turn around and treat it as an itemized charitable dedu deduction. Yep. The benefit I'm getting out of the whole deal is that I'm not paying taxes on that on those dollars that I sent directly to the to the charitable organization. Okay. 
Thank you, Tom. But see, there's a separate form here, um, non-taxable retirement distributions, where you just go in and check, check if it's a QCD, and it's up to you to adjust the amount on the 1099R. And like you said, they have to be 70 and a half. Uh, my financial advisor told me that I couldn't do that because I, I had an RMD. I, it needed to be part of my RMD, and, and actually he's wrong. Uh, at 70 and a half, you can give that money away, period. Yeah. Even if you're not doing it as an RMD. You can use it as part of your RMD, but it's yeah, not required. you can. Right, yeah. Yeah. But the point on this as far as the... Uh, that and what I was talking about with the notes. Go back to here. See, it's not on the 1099R, so you got to have some other document that verifies that because it's not on the 1099R. I mean, you're manually putting it in tax layer, so you have to see something. The client just came in and said, Oh, that one was a QCD. I'm going to be very skeptical. It says, no, you should have seen, you got some documentation that tells me this was a qualified charitable distribution. Because the charitable is, organization they, is typically going to send you a, a sheet of paper saying, thank you for this contribution or whatever it was. Yeah. And I, they will mention that it's a QCD yes. as far as they know. That's, yeah, that, and that's the key. It's our, the, the, the charity usually, again, it's usually on the documentation they receive and they're, they are, I don't know if, if it's legally obvious, but typically, yes, they will put text like I had in that church letter saying, hey, thank you for this, and it was a QCD. Did that Mark, change that to 71 when, when RMDs changed to 71? No, did not. no, so it's still 70 and a half? That, yeah, they, they lost that synchronization. The QCD is still 70 and a half, and the... Okay. Uh, the RMD requirement, I think, is it 71 or 72? It went up. 72. 72. Oh, 72. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the other so one, Mark, I, again, question. I, I put, go ahead. Um, I put, I didn't know what to put in the state field on the, um, on the 1099R, right? You reduce the taxable amount for the, um, for box two there. And I know we weren't working state returns. I did happen to notice that it captured the reduced amount into the Iowa form in my package, yep. so, um, even though I hadn't made any change to the state taxable uh, amount on the uh, 1099 r itself. No, I was going to suck whatever's in the federal one as a starting point. So if you put if you if you change that 1099 r on the federal side, it's going to that's going to flow down to the state. And I say this is what this is one of the only cases that I know of where we intentionally do not put what's on the 1099R into tax layer. Where we, where we actually tweak the data that we have. Otherwise, you wouldn't want to make sure it all matches up. Uh, the other one, I'm, I wasn't, I'm not trying to, I wasn't trying to. I was trouble for anybody, but just the other one that we run into is somewhere in some cases capital capital gain and loss. We do see those during the year occasionally. Um, it's really straightforward if you have the right number to start with. It's really easy to put in, you know, it's plug and play and tax layer, but getting that that number to start with, it's almost necessary that you have last year's 1040 package. Because the, the last pages in your package is the capital loss carryover. Um, so let's get out of this. Let's go back over to their 1040. One of the last pages down here. That's Iowa. Last page is always the, they have social security. The last page is, is always the social security worksheet. And then right before that is this capital loss carryover. And that's the number for next year. So you want to look at last year's return and look at this worksheet and say, what's my starting point for this year's calculation? And so that was a start. And this is the starting point. So if they come back next year with a capital loss, or then 
or capital loss. This will be the starting point for the capital loss that they're carrying over. Another similar one, Mark, is the foreign tax credit because it's limited and you have a schedule for those. So I always have excess to carry over because, you know, I don't I don't know what the limit is. I think it's seven hundred and fifty dollars or something. But we don't I, don't. I know what you're talking about. I haven't seen a lot of that. carry loss carry capital loss carryover. We do see. I haven't seen the foreign tax carryover at least in our clientele. Yeah, I mean, I know I have it every year because quite a bit of mine was overseas. But so my question on capital loss carryover is if they did their taxes with us in 2021, since we're doing 2022 taxes, will that automatically import? No. Okay. Nope. That is not an import. And if they don't have that worksheet from the previous year, but you had to have last year's taxes, there are, you work with your site coordinator because there are ways you can back into that and get the number, but it's, it's not as nice as having that worksheet right there to get the number off of. Mark, I didn't mess with it, but does it matter short versus short-term versus long-term? Would, would we have gotten to the same number if we had put it in as a short-term carryover? Um, I don't know. Good question. I can't, I don't have an answer. I almost think we would, but I haven't gone back and tried it. Let's go. So on the capital loss carrier, does it even ask on here whether it's short or long? Now there you have the short term. Yeah, there's I'd different, have to, different I'd have to, I'd have to step through the worksheet and see what difference it makes. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen a short-term carryover, at least in what I've seen. The ones I've seen have all been long-term, but that's a good question. I don't know what the short-term would do. Different. You have to step through when you say, step through the worksheet and see how it would change. Anything else with... Um, with the Salzburgs. Okay. You guys did, <clears throat> didn't have either you're not speaking up or didn't have that many questions because we got through this a lot faster than I thought we would. Anything you guys want to go back over at all for any of these? Okay. Next steps. Next training is next Saturday. Um, in that one, we're going to talk about our process. I'm going to hope to have two more scenarios out, maybe a third, but probably at least two. We're going to talk about our processes at the site, how we handle um, when we're dealing with, with missing documents or out of scope, in-person versus drop-off, that kind of stuff. We're going to work through all that until we try, we're going to try to understand this so we can be consistent as possible at every site. How we're going to handle handing off to QR, those kind of things. Um, and the 28th, we're going to cover Iowa, get much more into Iowa. As far as, uh, like I said, this time I didn't even bother putting a lot of the Iowa stuff in. Uh, we'll talk about all those impacts. And even though it doesn't affect this year's um, season, I'm going to talk a bunch about what's coming up next year for Iowa. Iowa is through a whole, through everything up in the air, a whole new ball game in 2023 for Iowa. And not that it affects us what we do this year that much, but I anticipate we'll get some questions from clients. You know, what do I do about next year? Well, 
we're not tax advisors, but it helps to understand what the changes are next year. So we can have some idea of what, what we're gonna be facing uh, down the road. So we'll talk about that on the 28th as well. I hope all of you have gone in for mayor of the sake and um, looked at what you want for sites and, and times to help out. Again, January 30th is that that's the week we first start working with clients. Okay, I haven't seen anything about sign up genius and signing up for for shifts and things like that. Okay. And this, I'm sorry, who's speaking? Patty. Okay, I will forward it on to you today. Thank um, you very you much. Meredith, no, I mean, have you got any other stuff from Meredith, other mail? Um, not recently. And I left her a phone message right after I sent all my um my yeah. certification notification and I and that was like the week yeah. of Chris right after we did our last evening training and I've heard I've not heard anything since then sometimes the emails from Meredith for me show up in like my junk email box I check my spam okay. regularly and yeah. I have not seen anything so you are getting you're getting my emails right obviously. yes I am Okay, then I will forward on to her and say this is, and let her know what you're, what I've got for you. Make sure she doesn't have a typo or our email addresses match up. Okay, that, yeah, because I've had problems in the past, and it's it's kind of a getting to be a joke now. Yeah. But so good. I'll look for that email today and go look at shifts because I'm. I guess I'm getting a little anxious about that with some of the other things I have going on. Okay. Let me get that sent out today. Uh, so Mark, you Mark. So we only got one pet. This is Patty Jacoba, right? That is correct. Okay. Just make sure, being paranoid here, making sure him <laughs> folks off to the right folks. Mark, I just wanted to let you know, too, I sent uh, Meredith a email response to her email after I sent over my certificate because when you click on the little box to try to do the electronic signature, it doesn't work. Oh, really? It says you can electronically sign, but on mine, the screen just went grayish black. It wouldn't, it didn't fill in the spot. It did have my name next to it. So I sent it to her and I said, will this work or do you need me to actually physically sign it? And I never heard back from her. And I also left a voicemail and she didn't call me back either. And voicemail is not, she gets buried in voicemail. So, um, but usually email, she does a decent job of getting back on. Um, but I'll I'll check with her on that. I just want to make sure. Okay. Um, that's a question I've I've tried to reach her two or three times on what we're supposed to send to her. You know, I did the IRS form, but on the certifications of, of what we've tested out of, are we supposed to just like screenshot that or what? Because I don't need a document. Uh, out of the system for that. So you couldn't get the certificate generated? Is that what I'm? Well, I mean, I mean, I get the ones to print out, but she said, "Don't worry about printing them out." Then, right? Yeah, but there's a thirteen six fifteen. After you get list, you know, here's what you passed. Yeah. On the right hand part of that, there is a little checkbox saying, "Okay, generate your thirteen six fifteen form." Right. And I've done that, but that just lists. It doesn't list any courses in mine, I don't think. I'll have to relook at email, my email that I mailed to her. But um, so I didn't know if she goes and verifies those by going online somehow. I'm uh, sorry, because I don't have everybody on my screen here. Who's who was I speaking with? Uh, this is Russ. I'm sorry. Okay. Thanks. Russ, on the one I did, it actually put P's in for the three things that I passed, and the, and the system did that automatically. Yeah. But I mean, when I look at the screen, I see I passed them all, but I don't have a form that it's printing out that says that. It just shows I did the uh, standard of conduct and I agree to the, you know, the regulations and all that. But I'll go in and try it again, but um, if I can find my email I mailed to her. Okay, I will touch base with her and, and mention you guys 
your guys' issues and see what happens on that. I okay. did notice, I, I tried to do it on an iPad and I had to go on to my laptop in order to generate that. Just Yeah, I was doing it on my computer. So I'll try again. <laughs> But it's already past the deadline, so it's. I've been trying to get a hold of her for two weeks. Yeah. All right. So there's been some uh, turnover at United Way, and some of the folks that were helping her out are no longer United. So she's getting buried with some some stuff that she didn't have earlier. So. No, I'm not. I'm not faulting her at all. <laughs> okay. And I really want to thank you, Mark. You do a great job. Well, thank you. And Mark, that all of these sessions will be um, recorded, correct? Because I'm this not going to make the 28th, so I'll have to listen to the 28th. And everything's recorded, should be out there. She should have, uh, you know, sent everything out there. Uh, I think she, I'd say if you didn't get the link for where to go find the stuff on the United Way site, uh, we'll take care of that. We'll make sure. So anything else as far as any other final questions on this? Okay. Hey, Mark, I know we're not going to talk about state for a couple of weeks, but did you say before we can do other states other than Iowa? If people have like income in one in part of the year in one yeah, state? Yes, we do. If they're, if they're fairly straightforward, we muddle through with like Iowa, um, Minnesota, Wisconsin. I've done a Missouri. Um, Steve Tyson can help you with Colorado. Colorado is pretty straightforward because Steve spent time, a lot of time in Colorado. So, uh, but usually it's say we're not trained and we let the client know that we're doing the best we can. I mean, I always make sure full disclosure saying, okay, I will put through my best. I think it's fairly straightforward. I'll put in your Illinois stuff, but bear in mind, I am not certified for Illinois. Uh, and it's usually not been a problem. Usually 90% of the time that I won, they did a little work. They moved to Iowa, did some work, and it's just a W-2. And all we're doing is getting their withholding back. That's usually what it turns out to be. And in that case, it's pretty straightforward. The trickiest part that I've run into in the other states is getting in the, because in Iowa, it's tough me you know, in Iowa getting the, uh, lived in the state part of the time, getting in all that data input right. Sometimes it's not a, it's not as intuitive like Illinois and Wisconsin on that screen saying, okay, I was in Wisconsin for the first six months of the year, then I moved out and getting that all set up right is the key to the whole thing. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Anything else I need to go back over? Mark, this wasn't a question. I know you're going to get to Iowa, you know, in a couple of weeks, but your uh, your worksheet that you put out before on common credits and other limits yep. would be, uh, would be very helpful to have one for the state of Iowa as well. What specific things are you thinking about for our, that are that are unique to Iowa? Uh, the standard deduction amount, so you can check pretty quickly if okay. it's going to be itemized or not. Okay. Mark, I reviewed those certificates. It does have a little P in there. So I just didn't see it. Thank okay. you very much. So. Yep. Anything else you want on that Iowa sheet, Greg, we were thinking of? Uh, Maybe no. the IRA deductions for, or, you know, for 600 or 6,000 and 6,000, is that still the same? The oh, total? for the uh, retirement? Yeah, yeah, retirement income. Yeah, that hasn't changed. I can put something, I can put stuff on there about that. The, uh, and at least put something, something about that. But we're going to talk about, you know, you know, allocations and things like that. But as I said, talking about 2023, this is the last year we're going to have to deal with a lot of stuff. 2023 is going to really uh, throw things up in the air. Anything else anybody has? All right, then you guys were didn't have a lot of time, a lot of questions. We had some, but I expected a lot more discussion. So 
I don't know if that's good or bad, but you guys have a great rest of your day. And uh, I'll send some more, a couple more scenarios out, plus another, I'll update some resource sheets. And we'll see you all a week from today on the 14th. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Very much. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you.